Well, good morning, church. It's time to worship. Let's sing about His amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? thankful for his amazing grace and uh, it's so good to be here together to worship together and those of you who joined us online thank you for doing so and uh, we've got an exciting announcement uh, next Sunday uh, our, we are not going to require anyone to RSVP you don't have to do that anymore we have plenty of seating we have a live stream going to uh, our family center and so that area uh, environment will be open to you and it's just an, it's an awesome experience out there too and so there's plenty of room, and we invite you to come and worship with us each Sunday at 1030 here at South Union Baptist Church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day you've given us to come and worship you, Lord, to sing about your grace, and, and Lord, to sing about the comfort that we gain from knowing who you are and who your son Jesus is. And Lord, we lift our prayers up to you today, Lord, to cover our nation, Lord, with healing. Lord, we just ask for your guidance, uh, your strength, and your wisdom not only in our nation, but our state and our communities, Lord, as we seek to get back to normal. Lord, we just pray for that, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.
There are moments on our journey following the Lord when God illumines every step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each move he makes. But when Our questions have no answers. Turn to Him. Bow the knee. Trust the heart of the Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. And when you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of There are days when clouds surround us, the rain begins to fall, and the cold and lonely winds won't cease to blow. And there seems to be no reason for this suffering we feel. We are tempted to believe God doesn't know when the storm arise don't forget we live by faith and not by sight bow the knee trust the heart of the father when the answer goes beyond what you can see Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven, and believe the one who holds eternity. When you don't understand the purpose of his plan, in the prayer of your King. Bow the knee, trust the heart of the Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds and when you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of your When you don't understand the purpose of God's plan in the presence of your King.
We have a king and a friend all in one in Jesus. We've been singing this song a lot over the last few months, and uh, I'll tell you, we need it. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and our griefs our burdens to bear. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What
yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today There's no reason to wait Jesus is called Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born.
Have you ever heard or used the phrase, it's high time? My mom, she used to say that. Uh, she'd say, I tell you what, it's high time that you clean up your room. She'd say to my brother, she'd say, hey, it's high time that you, uh, you get your grades up. She might say to us as kids, she said, you know what, it's high time that you respect me. I mean, that's just one of the things that she would say. She could use it a thousand different ways. And what she was saying was just simply this, that, hey, it's, it's time now, right? The time is now. It, it's urgent. You need to get on this thing, and you need to do it right now. The phrase high time was certainly not original to my mom. As a matter of fact, the phrase high time is found in the Bible. Last week we were in Romans chapter 13. We're talking about honor and choosing to honor and how the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and he said, hey, hey, you're under this Roman government. You're under this Roman rule. It's a part of God's authority structure. And here's what I want to ask you to do, and that is that you would render honor to whom honor is due. But if you slip down just a few verses, you come across this phrase, it's high time. It's high time. And what Paul says to these Roman Christians is that it is high time that you wake up. He uses this phrase to say, hey, you need to get on it. You need to step up to the plate. You need to arouse out of your sleep. It is time to step up in terms of your faith. And perhaps he could say that to us today as Christians. If Paul were writing a letter to the church at South Union, maybe he could say to us, hey, South Union, it is time. No, it is high time that you awake from your sleep. I want to preach to you this morning a message entitled, It's High Time to Wake Up. Three things I want to share with you. Number one, who needs to wake up? Who needs to wake up? You know, we could look around our world today and we could say, I tell you what, I think there's some politicians who need to wake up. Maybe we could look and say there's leaders on both sides of the aisle. They need to wake up. You know, we're, we're in an election year. We might look around our, ourselves today and say, I tell you what, there's some voters who need to wake up. Maybe from a spiritual standpoint, we might look around the world and say, the world needs to wake up. The world needs to wake up. I'm talking about people who are lost. They need to wake up. Maybe in our little world, I'm talking about our social world, we could look around and say, there's some people who disagree with us. And we could say, you know what? They need to wake up and understand the truth. A lot of times we look at people and say, you know what, man? They're just clueless. And there's some clueless people who need to wake up. And we might say it this way, they need to wake up and smell the roses and these people may very well need to wake up but I want you to see this that Paul was referencing here he was referencing here that it's Christians who need to wake up Romans chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 let me read to you the text if you have your Bibles Romans chapter 13 verses 11 through 14 the Apostle Paul says and that knowing the time That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting and in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Paul says it's Christians who need to wake up. He's writing here to these Roman Christians. He says, hey, it's time to wake up. Maybe for us too, it is time that we wake up. You know, I think about the phrase that is used in reference to Christians. We talk about the church. We talk about being a giant. But that's not how we say it, is it? We call the church the sleeping giant. I think it's time for Christians to wake up. Why should we wake up? Number two, why wake up? Two reasons, Paul says here in his text. Two reasons. Verse 11, he says, because Jesus is coming again. Paul says that we need to wake up because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Hey, I want you to think about this. If I were to ask you this question, do you know, do you know, do you know that you're saved? Do you know that? You might say, hey, man, I know that I'm saved. And here's my question to you. Do you know that you've repented? Do you know that you've asked Jesus to save you? Do you know that you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior? So I might ask it this way. Do you know, do you remember 
when you first met Jesus, and I don't mean the day, I don't mean the time, the hour, maybe not even the season of the year, but do you remember the experience of meeting Jesus as your personal Savior? And if you can remember, if you can remember that experience, I would ask you, how did you feel? And I realized that not everyone, it's not a feeling thing, okay? I'm not saying that. But for many people, it's like, hey, man, I felt this burden released. I felt life come into me. Man, I felt alive. Several years ago, our kids were putting on a musical, and uh, Christy, she asked me, she said, would you be willing to play the part of a, of a narcissistic reporter? His name was Rod Stark. I mean, he was. He was a narcissist. I mean, he was into himself. It was all about the camera and how he looked. But, but during the musical, uh, old Rod Stark, he gets saved. And right after his salvation experience, he looks over to his cameraman, and he tells his cameraman, he says, hey, hey, man, uh, let's do a report. And his cameraman asks me, he says, hey, tape or live? And Rod Stark says, live, man, because I have never felt so alive before. You know, every day that we live, it would appear as if we're getting further and further and further away from our salvation experience. And there's some truth in that. I got saved when I was nine years old. I'm 49 years old today. I might say, man, I'm 40 years further removed from my salvation experience. But Paul says, no, no, no. Every day we live, we're actually getting nearer. We're getting closer to our salvation experience being made complete. Paul says that our salvation is nearer than the day that we first believed. You see, when I believed, I got justified. I, I, I got a new spirit in me. Every day that I live, I'm, 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 being, or, or I'm supposed to be, I'm getting sanctified I, in a practical way. I'm being sanctified every day, set apart from sin. One day, I'm going to be glorified, and that's when my salvation experience is going to be made complete. This is why the Bible says things like this, like our redemption draws nigh. You see, Jesus is coming again. And our salvation is going to be made complete. And that's a good reason to wake up. Number two, because judgment is sure. In verse 12, he says, because the day is at hand. And the day that he's referencing is judgment day. You see, one day we're going to stand face to face with Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, no doubt. But also our High Priest, our Advocate, and our Judge 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things that we've done in this body, whether they be good or bad. We're all going to give an account of the stewardship of our lives. You know, we think about the word stewardship, and, and most of us say, hey, when I think about being a steward, I'm thinking about what I'm doing with the finances that God has entrusted to me. And while that is true, that we're stewards over the finances that God has entrusted to us, that's not the completion or the fulfillment, I'm sorry, or the totality of our stewardship. God, is. we're going to give a judgment of how we stewarded our life. Hey, our character, our integrity, our influence, our leadership, what did we do with our talents, our skills, our abilities? Yes, including our treasures, but there's so much more to it. It's not just that we're going to be standing in judgment of being a steward of finances, but rather we will stand in judgment of being a steward of Life, and here's what I want you to know, that sleepy Christianity isn't going to cut it on the judgment day. We won't lose our salvation in terms of judgment, right, when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, but we can lose reward. Sleepy Christianity will cause us to lose reward. Paul says, wake up. Number one, because Jesus is coming again. Our salvation is nearer than we first believed. And number two, because judgment is sure, we're going to stand before our judge on judgment day. And then number three, what should we do when we wake up? What should we do when we wake up? When we wake up spiritually, when we're revived, when we're saying, hey man, I want to get on this thing for God. What do we do when we wake up? Now, for me, when I get up in the mornings, I'm talking about just in terms of an illustration, first thing I do typically, I clean up, I take a shower, and then after I take a shower, I go to my closet. I pick out the clothes I'm going to wear for the day. I dress up. And then after that, I go to the kitchen and I eat breakfast. I eat up. And we talk about, hey, what should we do after we wake up? Hey, here's three things that we can do. We clean up. We dress up. 
and then we eat up. I mean, look at how practical Paul is here. In verse number 12, he tells the Romans, he says, hey, clean up. He says, cast off the works of darkness. These works of darkness are like rioting, drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, strife, envy. He says, hey, man, put off all of these things. He says, wake up and then clean up. Hey, cast off the works of darkness. And is it possible? Is it possible for Christians to be caught up in sin such as this? Absolutely. Yes, it's why he says it. He says to Christians, he says, cast off the works of darkness. In verse 13, he says, walk honestly as in the day. You get the picture here that at nighttime there's some bad things that typically happen and in the daytime it's when, when, when things that are not so bad are going on. I mean, there's, there's, it just seems like, hey, at nighttime that's when it seems like there's a spike in crime. In the daytime it's not there. He says, hey, walk honestly as in the day. In Philippians 1 and verse 27 he says, only let your conversation, that is your lifestyle, be as it becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. John the apostle said we're to walk in the light as he Jesus is in the light. Is it possible today that we need to clean up? Is it possible that we need to clean up? You say, oh, preacher, I don't need to clean up, man. I took a shower this morning. Hey, man, I'm not talking about physical cleaning. I'm talking about spiritual cleaning. You know, when we got saved, when we got saved and we came into a relationship with God, we were cleansed once and for all in terms of relationship. But every day of our life, we can do things, we can sin, and when we do, it can cause us to have fellowship that's broken. We can taint that fellowship. And so John says in 1 John 1 and verse 9, he says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hey, what do we do when we wake up? We clean up. Then number two, what do we do when we wake up? We dress up. I told you, hey... When I get out of the shower, I head to the closet. I pick out the clothes that I'm going to wear. I get up, I clean up, and then I dress up. Look what Paul says here in verse number 12. He says, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us put on the armor of light. Hey, when you think about this, what is armor for? What's the point of putting on armor? It's warfare. The point of putting on armor is to be prepared and to engage in warfare. You know, we're living in the days of wars and rumors of wars. We need to be careful that we not get distracted by that, that we not get distracted by the things that we see with our eyes because we are in the midst of a spiritual warfare. This is why Paul says it's high time. It's high time to wake up. It's high time to dress up. We're to put on the whole armor of God, the full armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Right? We wrestle against uh, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so he says, hey, put on the full armor of God. Put on the, 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 the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith. Hey, have your feet shod with the shoes of the gospel. Put on the helmet of salvation and hold in your hand and wield it the sword of the Lord, which is God's word. My friend, we need to wake up. We need to dress up because there is a battle that is raging around us. I want you to see the picture here that Paul is painting. He's picturing here that of a soldier who's been out at night. He's in his party clothes. He's gotten drunk. He's had a great time uh, and, 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 and he's party. But now his commander has called for him and he says, hey, it's time to get up. It's time to fall in. It's time to ship out. But he's unprepared. He's He has no wits about him. He's not dressed in his armor. He cannot engage in the battle. I want you to see what Paul is saying here, man, is that the reveille, the reveille is playing. It is time to get up. We got to wake up and we got to dress up. We got to dress up, number one, to prepare for battle. A soldier has to be armed in order to be prepared and ready for battle. If he's not armed, he's not ready. If a soldier's not armed, he'll never win the battle. And so we got to put on the armor of God. You say, how do we do that? We put on the armor of God by acting in accordance to the word of God. You ever thought about that? Hey, man, how do I put on the full armor of God? When Paul says, hey, hey, put on the belt of truth. Hey, can I tell you this? That that doesn't mean that I get up in the morning and I go through some type of a, of a, a fantasy thing where I say, oh, let me put on the belt of, the belt of truth. You know, I'm just going to put it on. That... We don't go through some actions and say, I'm going to put on the belt of truth. Let me, let me put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's not how that works. Right, we, don't, we don't go through some imaginary thing. 
Paul says, man, will you put it on by acting in accordance to the truth of God's word? We put on the belt of truth when we apply the truth of God's word to our life. When we take God's word, the truth of God's word, we apply it to our life. Hey, it's like putting on the belt of truth and everything else connects to the belt and is held sturdy in life. We put on the breastplate of righteousness when we act righteously. We hold the shield of faith when we trust God. When I put my faith and trust in Christ, he, he gave me salvation. He says, my salvation is like a helmet for you to protect your mind, to protect your life. And the gospel shoes, hey, we put those on when we walk about sharing the gospel, which brings men to have peace with God. That's what we do. He says, man, you need to prepare for battle. You need to get on the armor of light. And the reason we prepare for it is so that we can engage in the battle. As soldiers, we not only need to prepare for battle, but we must engage in battle. For listen to me, a person who has no armor on whatsoever, but isn't engaged in the battle, is not in the battle zone, they're just as safe as a person, an, a, a, a soldier who's armed to the teeth with, with, uh, with weaponry, but he's not in the battle either. I mean, the, it makes no difference. If you're not engaged in the battle, then you're pretty much safe. The whole purpose of getting prepared is so that we can engage in the battle. And the battle is raging, and we have to engage. This year, 2020, has been an odd year, and uh, one of the things the old coronavirus has knocked out is, is, is movies. And uh, people who grew up in my generation, you know, you're in your 40s. If you grew up in the 80s, if you were a teenager in the 80s, then this year was going to be Top Gun 2. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people are like, man, I'm looking forward to Top Gun 2, right? I was a teenager when uh, that movie came out. And, and you, you, you saw this movie about Maverick and his, his co-pilot, a goose, and then the competition that he had with the Iceman and Hollywood. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that they, they went out to California and they're, they're uh, uh, in this uh, training so that they become proficient dogfighters. And while they're there, they're doing a maneuver and, and Maverick loses control of his airplane and it is going to crash and they have to eject and, and Goose gets killed in, 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 as a part of this um, ejection maneuver and it really messes with the mind of Maverick. And then as you get to the end of the show, they're, they're called out of training and into the actual battle arena and an Iceman in Hollywood are flying, and Iceman says to Maverick, you know, hey, you, 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 you be my wingman, all right? And you, you, protect, you protect me, and they're out here in this battle, and man, uh, Maverick, he's just out of it. Mentally, he's out of it. He, he, he's not engaging in the battle. Now, think about it. Is he prepared? Is he prepared? I mean, he's flying an F-14 Tomcat. He's got missiles. He's got, you know, uh, he's got the cannon thing going on. He's got 50 caliber machine gun. I mean, this dude is armed completely but he's not engaging in the battle and eventually he just kind of wigs out and he flies away and, and Iceman's like Maverick Maverick engage engage the captain's back on the old aircraft carrier and, and they're crying out to Maverick you gotta engage engage Maverick and then you hear and Maverick he engages in the battle, man, and he gets after it. Here's the point. That's the whole, the whole reason that we get prepared is so that we can engage in the battle. We need to engage in the battle. The Apostle Paul says to us as Christians that it is high time to wake up. It's high time to dress up so that we can engage in the battle. You know, we look around our country today, and I'm telling you, if we could, now we can't, but if we could, if we could take and unzip a zipper between our dimension, this physical, visible dimension, and we could look into the invisible dimension that's right here, right? It's right here. We could see this, that right behind in the invisible dimension, there are forces at work seeking to control what we do see. That's why we've got to engage in the battle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against spiritual wickedness in high places we need to engage in battle because there is a battle raging all around us it's in our country it's in the community it's in our schools it's in our workplaces and hey perhaps even right here within our church 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul, he's talking to the Thessalonians, and he says to them, he says, I have wanted to come and visit with you. I've wanted to come not once, not twice, maybe three times. He says, but every time I wanted to come, he says, Satan hindered me. Man, that's, that's something to, to think about. That's something to chew on. I wanted to come visit you, but I was hindered by Satan. I got to thinking about that. I don't know if I'm right or wrong on this. I don't. It's just conjecture on my part. But I got to thinking that here's Satan who's watching old Paul and what Paul's got going on for the Lord, and he knows that Paul is working and striving to advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and Satan is doing everything he can. He says, I know his plans. I know what he wants to do. And Satan does everything he can to hinder Paul from carrying out the plan that God's placed upon his life and in his life and what he wants to get done. So he says, I got plans to come visit you, but Satan hindered me. And then I got to thinking about us today, and I just wonder if Satan looks down on us and he's like, I see what they got cooking, I see what they're doing, I see the plans that they have, and I don't even have to put up a roadblock. I don't even have to bring up a hindrance. I don't even have to do that because they're not really going anywhere for the Lord. Hey, are we engaging in the battle? We need to engage, and the way that we engage is that we pray. This is the one thing I know. The key to engaging in the battle is to use or to use the implements that we have. The key to doing that is we've got to pray. Ephesians 6 verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. We need to pray. We need to wake up. We need to dress up. Hey, listen, we need to pray up. We need to pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community. We need to pray for the advancement of the gospel, the salvation of lost souls. We need to pray for the strengthening of the inner man. And yes, we ought to be praying for our nation. Paul says you need to wake up, you need to, you need to clean up, you need to dress up, and then number three, he says you need to eat up. You need to wake up, clean up, dress up, and then eat up. Breakfast is said to us to be the most important meal of the day. So what do you do? You wake up, you clean up, you dress up, and then you eat up. One of the things I've learned about eating is this, is that you can't sleep and eat at the same time. At least that's true for me. Man, if I get drowsy, if I get sleepy, I can eat something. So recently in my family, we went on a 3,600-mile round trip from here out to Utah and then back through Colorado and back home. I mean, we were logging a lot of hours, a lot of miles every day in the car. And here's what I do, man. You, you know how it is. When you're driving, man, you get sleepy, you get drowsy. I mean, you got a couple of choices. You can pull over, you can take a nap, or you can just kind of fight through it. But this is what I do. I lean over to Susan. I put my hand out like this. I say, seed me. And she fills my hands up with sunflower seeds. Man, I pop those sunflower seeds. I'm driving down the road, cracking those seeds, spitting out those holes, eating those seeds. You know what? And I'm awake. No problems whatsoever. Here's what happens when we eat. Now, listen, we're not, when we're eating spiritually, but we don't eat snack foods. We need to eat nutritional foods. But this is what eating will do for us. It will keep us awake. It will. Paul says, wake up. And he says, clean up, dress up, eat up. Part of, part of what I've learned is that when we eat, it, it, it wakes us up. We need to feed the inner man. Look at what he says here. He says in verse 14, he says, make no provision for the flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. This is what he's saying. Don't feed your flesh. Don't feed your flesh. So if we're not going to feed the flesh, we better be feeding the inner man man and we feed the inner man when we engage in the classical spiritual disciplines things like feeding on God's word where we read God's word we study God's word we meditate on God's word we memorize God's word we hide it in our heart things like spending time in prayer getting alone with God worshiping God giving serving God by serving others evangelizing discipling others when we're doing those things we're feeding the inner man Speaking of God's Word, we're right now in the midst of what I'm calling the uh, Summer Drive. The Summer Drive is a 90-day reading plan where we're taking an overview of God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. We're taking 90 days to just kind of dig into God's Word. And here's what we do when we do that. We either start a habit or we reinforce a habit. Let me say it in a different way. We either start a discipline or we reinforce a discipline. 
That's what we need to do. Paul says, hey, don't make any provision for the flesh. So, hey, if I don't want to feed the flesh, if I want to starve the flesh, the best way to do it is by feeding the inner man. And if we'll feed the inner man with nourishment from God's word, if we'll spend time with God in prayer, if we'll rely on the power of the spirit, we can grow in maturity. And not just that, we can be changed to look like Jesus. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. He says, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In verse 14, he says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. The phrase to put on the Lord Jesus Christ means to become like Christ, to look like Jesus. Hey, to put Jesus on like a uniform. You know, an athlete may wear the uniform of a championship team. Could be like in football, someone could be wearing, you know, Kansas City Chiefs, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Chiefs, or it could be Toronto Raptors or, or you know, the Washington Nationals, all these teams that have won uh, their, their championship. But here's the reality. If an athlete wears the uniform of a championship team, he may take their name. But wearing the uniform and having the name isn't what determines the value of the player to the team. It is his performance that, uh, that determines the value of the player. Now, here's what I'm saying. It's not our performance, okay? It's not. But, but wearing the name Christian, you may wear the name Christian, but it isn't the name that determines the quality of your Christianity. What determines the quality of your Christianity is your spiritual faithfulness and your spiritual growth. So here's what Paul says. Let's wake up. Let's clean up. Let's dress up. Let's eat up so that we grow up to look like Christ. Here's the bottom line of the message. When we wake up, clean up, dress up, and eat up, we actually grow up to be like Christ. Let me repeat that. When we wake up, clean up, dress up, and eat up, we actually grow up to be like Christ. Recently, my girls and I, we, uh, we watched the movie Maleficent. I, I didn't even know what that movie was about. I didn't understand, you know, really what the name was or anything. And so my girls told me, well, uh, Maleficent is the after story of Sleeping Beauty. So it's about uh, Princess Aurora and Prince Philip's wedding. But you go back in time and you find the story of Sleeping Beauty. And Sleeping Beauty was about this princess who was cursed by a witch and, and the curse was that she would fall into a deep sleep and the only thing that could rouse her out of her deep sleep was the kiss of her true love. You know, there's some correlation there between us and Jesus and between the curse that she was in to sleep and the curse of sin that was placed upon man in the garden which really is the curse of death. And we see this that that only our true love can save us and wake us out of the curse of sin. But Jesus did way more than give a kiss. He gave us life on Calvary. Friend, I want to tell you today that if you've never put your faith or your trust in Jesus Christ, you need to wake up. And here's the reality is that you are asleep asleep under the curse of sin but Jesus gave his life he took your curse to the cross he died in your place so that you could be made alive so that you could have life I implore you today that if you've never put your trust your faith in him that today would be the day that you would trust him that you would come to life in Jesus Christ for every other person who is hearing this message today if you've already been saved you've already put your faith your trust in Jesus Christ then let's heed the words of the Apostle Paul let's wake up let's clean up let's dress up let's eat up and let's grow up to look like Jesus I want to thank you today for joining us in our worship today this online worship experience and I pray that today that you've been challenged by the preaching of God's Word I pray that you've been blessed by the preaching of God's word. And I hope to see you here next Sunday, whether it be here in our sanctuary or whether it be online. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you today. We pray. God, would you bless the preaching of your word? Lord, today would you encourage us? Would you 
motivate us, Lord? Would you rouse us up from any lethargy, Lord, any apathy that we may have, Lord, any complacency that we find ourselves in, Lord, any redundancy, Lord, just going through the motions that we may find ourselves in, Lord, to be people who are fully awake because of the work of Jesus Christ, Lord, that we would say, hey, I want to wake up because I want to be a part of the work of Jesus Christ. Lord, today, help us to be people who could clean up, Lord, people who would dress up, prepare, engage in the battle, people, Lord, who would eat up, Lord, not feeding the flesh, but feeding the inner man so that we could grow up to be like Jesus. Lord, our prayer is that you would use South Union Baptist Church in a mighty way, Lord, to advance and to further the cause of Christ, to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus. We love you. We thank you. I pray, Lord, for those who are lost and undone, Lord, that today, Lord, today would be the day of salvation, Lord, that they would wake up because of the work of Christ. And, Lord, for us, Lord, your followers, Lord, may we say, hey, it's, it's high time. It's beyond time. we got to wake up. we got to be on this thing. Help us to step up, Lord, to do, it, to do what it is that you've called us to do. Again, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping online. Lord, we pray for our church. I pray, God, that you would hold us together, Lord. These are difficult days, Lord. We've been separated from one another. But, God, I pray, Lord, that even through a means like this, Lord, via the Internet, God, that you would help to, to keep the bonds together. Lord, we love our church. I know that you love our church. Help us to love one another. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.